Okay, good afternoon to all of you. I would like to start this uh, webinar. Um, I would like to welcome you uh, to this Taylor van Boven lecture, uh, which the Faculty of Law is organizing every year to uh, honor one of the founding members of the Maastricht Center for Human Rights, namely Professor Theo van Boven. You can see a picture of him and at the first slide of this afternoon. To explain to, especially to the younger participants who Professor Van Boven is, uh, I will say a few words about his uh, professional background. Professor Van Boven has held many different positions in his long career, among others, the director of the United Nations Human Rights Secretariat in Geneva, from 1977 to 1982. He was also a UN Special Rapporteur on Torture and member of the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discriminations. And of course, a professor of international law at our university since 1982. Now he is Emeritus Professor of International Law. Unfortunately, due to personal reasons, Professor Van Boven cannot attend this uh, webinar today. The annual lecture is delivered by a guest speaker who will address a topic which is close to the academic and human rights interests of Professor Van Boven. In 2010, the first lecture was given by himself about a topic which is also relevant today namely the need to respect and uphold human rights as inclusive rights, instead of excluding people from enjoying rights, which we often witness today. In the selection of topics and speakers, the board of the Maastricht Center for Human Rights aims to be forward-looking and address subjects which are not only interesting from an academic perspective, but also raise issues that are relevant from a societal and practitioner's point of view. I'm therefore very happy with the choice of the subject of this year's lecture, which is indeed very topical, but also very important in our digital age, namely virtual justice. I now hand over to my colleague Doris de Vogt, who will introduce today's speakers and the topic. I wish you an enjoyable afternoon. Many thanks, Fons, for opening uh, this year's Theo van Boven lecture. Uh, also, on behalf of me, a very warm welcome um, to our panel members today. And, of course, also to the members of the audience, uh, which is, I can see, about 103 right now, at least minus the panel members, of course, uh, following this webinar via the link uh, or via live stream on YouTube. Um, you can use, and some of them has, have already, some of you have already found this, the question and answer tool in this uh, webinar uh, Zoom meeting to pose questions to our speakers later on. Um, and uh, hopefully you will do so. Uh, we will, uh, Professor Clip and I will be uh, selecting the questions, at least if there's an, uh, if it's necessary to select, uh, and we will uh, pose the questions to our speakers. Um, we will do so after the speeches have been delivered, both of them. So uh, room for discussion will be after um, the second speaker has finished. 
Uh, now, let me introduce to you our first speaker who will be speaking to us from the UK. Uh, she is the director of Transform Justice, which is a national charity campaigning for a more fair and more humane justice system. Um, she's also a visiting fellow at Kellogg uh, College, University of Oxford. She's involved in uh, research, uh, researching remote justice for many years and way before uh, COVID-19 was a thing, uh, I'm pretty sure. Uh, we're very happy and also very honored that she accepted our invitation to speak today on the topic of remote justice and how online or on-screen communication potentially affects the fairness of proceedings. So let me give the floor to Ms. Pen Penelope Gibbs. Thanks very much. I'd like to start with a quote from a defense lawyer. On those occasions when the video link works, we have very limited time. We often use a lot of it shouting for the custody staff at the other end to hear us and come into the video room and speak to us. When the defendant is produced on the other end, he seems remote. And I often find I can't be sure if he understands my empathy or sympathy or other emotions, which are essential to cultivating a working relationship in this very difficult circumstance. We have stilted conversations, which were often interrupted by delay in transmission or poor connection. I find video links an insult to the justice system. That testimony was from 2017, way before COVID-19. Thanks for coming to my lecture. To be honest, I feel a bit of an imp imposter. I'm not a trained lawyer or academic, but a campaigner who almost fell into researching remote justice seven years ago. My charity, Transform Justice, advocates for a fairer, more humane, more effective and open justice system. My knowledge of remote justice comes from England and Wales, from our primary research, surveying and talking to lawyers, judges and court staff, from observing courts and from reading official documents and other research. We've published one report, many blogs, a number of submissions to parliamentary committees and umpteen tweets on remote criminal justice in England and Wales. And I think a link's gonna be put up to a blog post that I've done, which has all the links. I'm not sure what happened there, but I think I got muted for a minute. So a report, Defendants on Video, is on our website and the blogs are searchable using the tag digital courts. And I've written lots of blogs on this subject. I'm not gonna use PowerPoints today because they don't work well on Zoom. But after this lecture, I'll post the whole lecture on my blog. Today, I'll sketch out the history of remote justice in England and Wales, the impact of COVID-19 on it, and what we know about the impact of being remote on suspects, defendants, and on procedural justice. I'm afraid I won't really touch witnesses because I don't know much about it. Procedural justice refers to the perceived fairness of rules and of the decision-making processes used to determine outcomes. So this story of remote justice started in England and Wales a long time ago. No one has ever written the history, so I've pieced it together, sometimes from scraps. In 1992, the court service and the prison service first tried linking a prison and a court by video so that prisoners wouldn't have to be transported many miles for a short court hearing. In those days, our government commissioned full evaluations quite early on. In this case, in 1999, by which time there were several video linked prisons. The evaluation of these pilot remote hearings was positive overall. The only problem is that there, were no, there was no reliable finding on justice outcomes and no one observed defendants appearing remotely in real time. So they didn't discover how remote affects behavior, either of defendants or those in the court. 
On the basis of this evaluation, the government went ahead to set up prison to court video links nationwide for prisoners to take part remotely in pretrial hearings, never for trials and initially never for sentencing. No monitoring research or evaluation has been done of prison to court links since 2000. They're hailed as a big success because most prisoners like them. But prisoners are faced with Hobson's choice. Either get up at three in the morning to go to court in a disgusting sweat box van, only to get back to prison too late to get dinner, or nip out of your cell just for a couple of hours to take part in your court hearing remotely. The scales are tipped for prisoners by the risk that going to court may also involve being moved to another prison, which is their worst nightmare. So no wonder prisoners like video links, but issues of procedural justice are not factored in and the availability of video links can lead to abuse. Many lawyers have recently related that they've traveled to court for a hearing and waited for their client to appear on video, only to be told that the client has refused to leave their prison cell. The same lawyers have subsequently visited their client in prison and discovered that the prison had been economical with the truth, that the prisoner wanted to take part in their hearing, but had not been unlocked from their cell due to staff shortages. So video is making it easier for prison staff to prevent defendants attending their own hearing. The use of prison to court video links expanded even pre-COVID. They're now used for many sentencing hearings and for even pre-COVID and for an increasing number of remand hearings where the defendant is requesting bail pending trial. In 2009, Nine, a bright spark suggested that remote first hearings should be trialed. So this is the first hearings that people do, not once they've got to prison. And this would be through setting up video links from police custody to the magistrate's court. In England and Wales, we have an adversarial system and all criminal cases start in the lower court. Most suspects detained in police custody are released on bail before their first court appearance but a minority are kept in custody until court. At this first appearance, the defendant pleads guilty or not guilty. If guilty, they might be sentenced on the spot, perhaps to prison custody. If awaiting trial, they might be remanded or given bail. Normally, these de detained defendants appear in person. They've been transported in a secure van from police custody to court. They meet their lawyer in court cells and give instructions there. The new idea was for defendants to stay in police custody and be linked by video to the court with a lawyer advocating either from police custody or for, from the court. The pilot of this way of doing justice had poor outcomes. These police to court hearings proved to be much more expensive than traditional hearings. Nevertheless, the flame of enthusiasm for remote justice was never extinguished. In 2015, a group of senior judges mulled what to do about the funding of courts in England and Wales. Court buildings were dilapidated and under austerity that was unlikely to change. But the white heat of technology offered hope. So the judges, inspired by Professor Richard Suskind, decided that the only way to retain sufficient funding in the system was to replace courts with online and remote hearings. They persuaded civil servants and ministers to fund a massive 1.2 billion court reform program, which they believed would save money in the long run. Many proponents of court reform, such as Professor Suskind, say the driver was or should have been access to justice rather than efficiency. But a document I took two years to obtain from the Ministry of Justice suggests that the motivation of the government's digital court reform program was indeed cost saving. The management consultants, the Boston Consulting Group, were asked in 2016 by a skeptical Ministry of Justice to look at the viability of the program. Their report warned that, quote, reforms are framed around efficiency and proportionality 
not policy or broader social benefits. Fast forward to 2020. Millions of pounds had been spent by the court service on consultants, software, and extra staff before the pandemic hit. So were criminal courts ready to go online? Not really. But in the spring, they went ahead anyway, doing little entirely remotely, but increasing the number of parties being beamed into courts. Defense and prosecution lawyers throughout the country were allowed to appear on video from home or their office. Most police custody suites set up makeshift systems, usually just a laptop, so they could all host defendants for their first court appearance. So hardly any defendants would need to go to court. The judge and court staff continued to appear physically in the court. At the beginning of the pandemic, these first appearances of defendants detained by the police were practically the only criminal hearings. The next to start up again were magistrates court trials. These are these lower courts and then crown court trials involving juries. So what do we know about procedural justice during the pandemic and how it might have been affected by remote? Way too little, but I have some thoughts based on what I saw in the courts and what I've picked up from practitioners. First, I'll focus on the pre-hearing relationship between lawyer and suspect or defendant. This has been revolutionized by the pandemic. In England and Wales, suspects detained in police custody have a right to a legally aided and trained representative to support them before and during their interview with the police. Pre-pandemic, these legal representatives always went into police custody to meet their client, sometimes in the middle of the night. Suspects detained by the police are inevitably stressed and so vulnerable. They're often meeting their lawyer for the first time. That lawyer helps them understand the process and ensures their legal rights are respected. The lawyer may spot that their client has disabilities, which the police and the suspect themselves have not realized. And the lawyer will fight tooth and nail to prevent their client being detained in custody any longer than necessary. The pandemic has changed this relationship between law, lawyer and client, perhaps fundamentally. Lawyers were wary of going into police custody at the beginning of the pandemic. They felt it was unsafe because of a lack of social distancing and PPE. So a protocol set up a new way of working. As long as the client consented, the lawyer could give advice from home, either on the phone or a video call. Everyone concerned was consulted about this protocol, apart from suspects themselves. That box was deemed ticked by providing for their consent. But we still have no idea whether suspects really understand the choice in front of them and how it's framed. There's no data, but we think that most legal advice is being given remotely and that lawyers can be very reluctant to go into custody even if requested. This is understandable, given that they feel custody is unsafe. Custody is a closed world and no one is privy to the consultation between a lawyer and their client, or shouldn't be. But Transform Justice has recently gained some insight into that closed world. We've done a survey with NARN, a charity that supports appropriate adults. These are volunteers who go into custody to support vulnerable suspects. So in England and Wales, every adult suspect assessed as particularly vulnerable and every child must have an appropriate adult to safeguard their legal rights. They don't give legal advice, but they abide by the safeguards of what's called PACE in this country. Appropriate adults or AAs have been going into custody throughout the pandemic, so they've seen uh, legal advice given remotely from the inside of custody. We asked AAs about their experiences supporting suspects whose lawyers were not physically with them. The survey responses of AAs suggest that remote advice can create a lot of problems. For a start, in many cases, the suspects are not even asked whether they consent to their lawyer giving advice remotely, as this quote illustrates. 
Not one single suspect I've attended for has been asked whether they consent, and neither have I been as the AA. Suspects also sometimes feel under pressure to consent. So here's a quote. Suspects think that they don't matter and have said, the lawyer will be horrible to me if I make them come to the police station. The problem with not seeking consent or with a suspect feeling pressurized can then manifest in the actual interview. One appropriate adult said, on a number of occasions, the suspect and myself have requested for the solicitor to attend. Each time this has been refused. On approximately nine occasions, the interviews have needed to be stopped because the suspect was angry at the solicitor and felt they should be there. Appropriate adults related many examples of remote ad advice going fine. So it's not all bad, but we have no idea how often things go wrong. And the survey reinforces the need to find out how suspects and defendants feel about remote advice. We have no empirical evidence and no one has heard the unmediated voice of the suspect. Many suspects get charged by the police and then have to face that first court appearance. We have a lot of testimony about the difficulties faced by defendants in communicating with their lawyers on video or phone. The lawyers we interviewed in 2017 had huge concerns about remote consultation before hearings, either with clients in police custody or in prison. There were considerable technical problems as there still are. The time available to talk to clients was too short and too rigid, often amounting to little more than 10 minutes for the lawyer to do introductions, understand what the case is about, what the evidence is, what disabilities the client might have, and to advise the client how to plead and prepare them for their hearing. Lawyers suggested that communication barriers, barriers continued into the court hearing with defendants unable to interject their views or communicate privately with their lawyer during the hearing. Any problems there were pre-COVID with virtual justice have been amplified by measures taken in the last few months. In some ways, the technology has improved. The CVP platform, which is like Teams, works okay. But the tech used in police custody that I've observed has been very ropey, and I've heard a lot of distorted sound. The image is poor too. I've sat in courts and tried to watch defendants and lawyers appearing remotely. If you're back in the public gallery, the screens are not very big and are on the side walls of the court. So the image for anyone in the public gallery or for the judge is also distorted by the angle of those screens. The defendant and their remote lawyer appear small and distant. When I observed magistrates' courts in the pandemic, I saw defendants both on video and in person. There were a few in person. The experience of seeing that defendant in person, albeit in the dock, which is what we do to these people who've been in police custody, was completely different to seeing them online. Their presence was real and full size, and when they wanted to speak, they generally could. The defendants who appeared on video from police custody into court seemed unprepared for their hearings, even when they were legally represented. In many cases, the lawyer didn't seem to have been able to talk to their client before the hearing or knew little about the case. So in April, I saw a woman who appeared on video from police custody. Her lawyer was on a different video screen but no one seemed to know why she'd been detained or what offence she was accused of. We waited and waited as the lawyers and legal advisor tried to work it out before the judge understandably lost patience and broke for lunch, leaving the poor woman still in police custody. In another case, the judge asked the defence lawyer whether the figure on the video screen was his client. The lawyer said he didn't know since he had never seen his client. That defendant had serious mental health problems. What I observed 
chimed with some of the previous research on video hearings. There isn't nearly enough of this, either internationally or in England and Wales. Dr. Carolyn Mackay, author of The Pixelated Prisoner, has done great observational research in Australia. In, in, in England and Wales, there have been only two independent studies in the last 10 years. In 2010, the government evaluated the pilot programme of video linking police custody suites to courts. This was mainly an economic cost benefit analysis, but also looked at the fairness of the process. The researchers found that lawyers were concerned that location in a custody suite within a police station might influence the behavior of defendants, for example, by encouraging them to plead guilty or refuse representation as a means of speeding up the process. Guilty plea rates were higher in the pilot than in traditional courts and representation rates were lower. Where a solicitor was located in the courtroom, his or her physical separation from their client could hamper confidential communication and the provision of legal advice during the hearing. Despite these concerns and the negative cost benefit assessment, these video links between police custody and court continued in one of the areas, Kent. And in 2018, a new evaluation was commissioned whose primary focus was new software to help list the cases in court and police custody. This was called Video Enabled Justice or VEJ. But it also looked at effective participation based on extensive court observations in the video court and a traditional court. The researchers found, quotes, some evidence that defendants may be less engaged in video court hearings when the outcome is delivered. Defendants in video hearings are more likely to be passive or expressionless compared to non-video court. This resonated with our own research, which suggested that the disconnection from a court often causes a defendant to tune out. Alternatively, disconnection could lead to defendants becoming frustrated, partly because they found it hard to communicate, partly because they were divorced from the formality of the courtroom. A lawyer said that some defendants, they kick off and they're rude, and they almost certainly wouldn't do that if they're actually there in person. I've had one or two of them who have actually hit the equipment and sp smashed it up and kicked off. Because they're in a police station and they're not actually in the court, there's no real sanction for that. When a defendant gets difficult or talks too much, there's always the mute button. A barrister interviewed for our research illustrated how the voice of the defendant is literally silenced in virtual courts. So he said, I've seen this on more than one occasion when the legal advisor just mutes the defendant. When the defendant is trying to talk in the courtroom, even if the judge isn't there, and the legal advisor just gets fed up hearing them because it's a very grating sound, because obviously he's shouting. He doesn't know well, how well it's heard. So it's very grating and they just mute them. The VEJ court observers found that the defendant was muted in 11.5% of cases and commented, muting can understandably be experienced negatively by defendants. Defendants have no ability to unmute themselves. So we have some, though not a lot, of empirical evidence of how being on video can affect the behavior of defendants. Unfortunately, we have no evidence of how seeing a defendant on video affects the behavior of judges and juries. The VEJ team did observe the demeanor of judges in both physical and virtual courts but weren't given permission to use the data. Getting a fair outcome is as important as the fairness of the process. The evidence we have on justice outcomes is sparse, but that there are indications that those on video make or are subject to different decisions. The 2010 evaluation found that more defendants who appeared on video pleaded guilty and more got custodial sentences. 
but Moore also appeared unrepresented without a lawyer. In the VEJ study, they found that video didn't seem to affect remand decisions, but did find that those on video received more prison sentences, and again, fewer were represented. Neither of these studies prove that video produces more punitive outcomes, but they do suggest that. We need much more data and controls on type of defendant and offence to make conclusions. Such a study should probe possible reasons for differences. Do lower levels of representation affect sentencing? Or does an inferior relationship between lawyer and their remote client affect the quality of defence? Or does the emotional disconnect between judge and remote defendant create unconscious bias in judges? The need for such an outcome evaluation is urgent since more and more defendants are being forced to appear on video. The court service in England and Wales committed to commission such a study in 2018, but they haven't done so. So do we know whether remote justice delivers procedural justice? We absolutely don't. But there are strong signs that remote participation is damaging trust in justice. In the VEJ research, defendants who appeared on video were less likely to be satisfied with the hearing outcome. And two former defendants likened video court appearances to the caging of animals. After my report was published in 2017, a serving prisoner wrote me a letter about his experience. He felt the remote process was unfair. So these are his words. My first court appearance was via a video link from the police station. I was in shock. I did have a duty solicitor, but she wasn't with me. I knew nothing of the system, as this was my only offence. I was in one room, the magistrate in one small box on the screen, my solicitor in another. The images were okay, but tiny, the sound quality poor, and we all waited for one another to speak or tried to do so at the same time. The magistrate kept asking advice from a person I couldn't see and necessary documents were not available. The whole process was both frustrating and surreal. The outcome was that I was remanded to appear in a couple of weeks. For the next court appearance, the judge asked the prisoner if he wanted to appear on video or in person. He wrote, I opted for a personal appearance at which I pleaded guilty. This was not at all a pleasant experience, and it would certainly have been less stressful for me to have simply had 30 minutes out of my prison cell for a video appearance in a prison room, rather than all day in a court cell for a 20 minute appearance in a real court. Hearing the prosecutor listing his understanding of my thoughts and actions, and the judge reiterating them and then condemning me, had an effect no video would ever have had. From even my brief experience of video links, it was clear I could have convinced myself that this was all merely another virtual experience. It was the real court experience that made me face up to my crime. That is just one defendant, but one whose understanding of procedural justice is undoubtedly shared by others. What's surprising about his story is that he was ever offered a choice as to whether to appear on video. Few prisoners are ever offered a choice. If they are, most people will offer, will opt for convenience, if that is the only dimension of the choice offered to them. But procedural justice has little to do with convenience and may be at odds with it. If a suspect's trust in their lawyer is undermined because they're not with them, in the police custody, or if a defendant's acceptance of their sentence is undermined because they couldn't see the body language of the judge, then we're undermining something fundamental for the sake of convenience. COVID-19 has massively accelerated the use of video and telephone because the wheels of justice have to keep moving. But at what price? In England and Wales, we definitely don't know. And my fear is that those in power don't really want to know. They've never commissioned a study into the impact of remote hearings on effective participation, on trust and on justice outcomes. 
The court service has commissioned a study on remote hearings during the pandemic, but it looks so small scale, it's unlikely to answer the big questions. So we still need someone somewhere to properly evaluate whether defendants perceive remote justice to be fair. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Gibbs, for this very comprehensive and vivid overview, I would say, of the developments and, and the experiences uh, you have had in the UK even well before uh, COVID-19. Uh, I think it very clearly illustrates the different pitfalls and potential problems that uh, go together with um, remote justice. Uh, and I also very much like that you, you rightly point out, I think, that it is mainly also connected to the fact that we don't know uh, the effects of remote justice. And there is a risk that often, uh, and especially now, during COVID and also after COVID, when we still have to work with huge workloads and, and, and a little amount of money, uh, a small budget, uh, that we tend to focus on short-term effects of efficiency and, and speeding up trials and not so much on the long-term uh, effects. And, and the problem, of course, is also that we don't know the long-term effects, as you, as you point out. There's, there's really a lack of research and of uh, empirical evidence. And I very much liked your, your quote that procedural justice is not about convenience. And this is something that, uh, that we should not forget, I think. We had already a question in the Q&A uh, tool. I think we will uh, keep that for our, after our second speaker, as we promised. Should there be other uh, members of the audience, please feel free to post your question uh, to Mrs. Gibbs and we will be sure to forward it to her after our second speaker has spoken. Uh, our second speaker, who I, who I will introduce right now, is closer to home. Uh, it is my honor to introduce to you Dr. Robert Horschleberg, who is an associate professor in the field of legal psychology with our Department of Criminal Law and Criminology at Maastricht University. And he will reflect on this topic uh, of remote justice from a psychological perspective. Um, we very much welcome Dr. Robert Horschleberg. Thank you very much. I will first try to solve an issue with sharing screens. And there we go. I hope it works. I think it does, isn't it? Excellent. Well, what I'm going to talk about is the more legal psychological approach of this whole Zooming courts, this distance online uh, court sessions. Um, to start with, you must remember that uh, statements made in court or at the investigative judge are, are evaluated as being more relevant than any statement made by the, at the police station. So those court sessions online with witnesses or suspects are, um, are very relevant to have a good look at what's happening there. Um, and um, I will look at it not only uh, from the perspective of the suspect, but also from the witness and the child witness, because there is, as the previous speaker already mentioned, there's a lack of research. There is some research on appearance, how to appear, how to dress your, uh, your client, uh, the suspect, in such a manner that it impresses uh, the, the judge, the court, the most. Um, but there's hardly any research on what does online appearance do and give, and what kind of an impression does it give? Um, so that's already the first issue. We have a problem with a lack of research. Well, why does my PowerPoint now not work? There we go. This is the new normal. This is how we started working since the past nine months. And I don't know about you, but I really don't like it. Uh, for lots of reasons, one of them being the technical issues. Uh, but secondly, you miss a lot of communication, which is fine, as I will also demonstrate in the next slide. But Looking at these pictures, if you don't know the man on the left side of the screen, is it my left or left? I don't know whether it's mirrored. 
uh, people might uh, recognize the guy. But if you don't know him, and if you hear him speaking, you might think, hmm, something is a bit odd with this man. And if this is the man who is your, um, your suspect or your witness, you miss a lot of information that can explain and can guide this image, this impression it has to you. Now, this new normal is also a positive side. Um, and, and this is the, the, the positive side of it. Well, people tend to have a truth bias, which is okay. We want to have a truth bias. We think people always tell the truth to us when we um, communicate with them. Um, but sometimes, especially in court cases, there might be an unintentional focus on lies. And the main focus we have for detecting lies is the nonverbal behavior, the fidgeting, the, 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 the gazing, the, the weird movements, or suddenly uh, sitting very still, uh, thirsty, all those kinds of getting a red face, all those kinds of nonverbal communication, nonverbal behavior is taken as an indicator of guilt. We also know that that's absolutely not the right way to look at it. Nonverbal behavior is not a good indicator of lie. Actually, we're not good at lie detection at all. So this is the positive side of Zooming, Skyping, whatever we use. We have lost those silly nonverbal cues. But there's a downside too, because it leaves this new way of communication, this online communication, it leaves us with a blank spot. I will start with what we know from witnesses. Um, most of this research, by the way, um, is based on research conducted in Sweden by a colleague of mine, Sarah Landström. Um, she wrote back in the 2010, 20 something, the first uh, decade of this century, uh, her dissertation on remote um, witness statements. Uh, in Sweden, just pure geologically, it's not always possible to transfer a witness or a child witness or a suspect to the court. So they do it on distance. So they have a lot of experience with distance online uh, courts. Um, and then if you look at what happens with those um, interviews of witnesses, for example, and if you compare them to live or videotaped, some of the uh, witnesses are not live interviewed, they were interviewed by the police, those interviews are videotaped, and then those videotapes are run down at the courts during the court sessions. So you have the full statement on video. And they've compared this with live statements in court. And here you can see that live, um, live statements are experienced as more consistent and more credible, especially this credibility assessment is very relevant in this case. If we talk about what's the final decision taken in court, it's based on the credibility assessment of both the statement of the witness and of the suspect. But online statements are taken as less credible Live statements are also taken as less, re, uh, less of a rehearsed story. It seems more authentic, it seems more normal, it seems more natural. The, na the narrative is told in a more, um, in a way we are used to listen to stories. Um, also in life, people tend to be experienced as less nervous. Like for example, now you can see my own hand movements, whereas I'm moving my hands a lot, is that an indication of nervousness? Of course not, not in my case. But if your witness is moving a lot and you miss it because of the point of view, you don't see it as being nervous or less nervous. There is also life, this experience of less gazing, which is logical if you look at the camera point of view. It focuses on the face and then if the eyes gaze, it gives, you, you notice it immediately. Another interesting finding is that live uh, statements in court 
resulted in a better memory of the people listening to it. So we remember better what is and was said by the witness if you compare it to an online statement. Now also that is relevant and closely related to the assessment of the credibility. If you remember the story being more consistent, you come to a more credible decision of that statement. If we look at child witnesses, we have a couple of possibilities. And I think also in the UK, you have the same system that you can have a live online uh, interview too. So you can have a live interview, a live online interview, or um, a, a recorded interview. And this is also the same thing uh, occurring in Sweden. So they compared those three. And what you can see is a clear um, 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 difference between live, live online, and recorded in terms of that life is perceived in way more positive terms. And positive terms is a quite broad uh, definition, but it is like uh, the, 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 the child was more um, um, empathic, was more um, um, credible, was more nicer, you know. All positive things were better perceived when it's a live interview. Also, life was rated more convincing. Whereas it was exactly the same story, life was found to be more convincing. And again, the same thing was found. A child that was interviewed live in court had the people who listened to it had a better memory of what was said. Another side story of this whole research is the um, presentation mode. Um, for example, now you see me only this part, but I can move the camera, I can move my chair, and you see a bit more of my gestures. That has also an effect on these two three factors. The more proximal the presentation, the better um, the, um, the statements are evaluated. Now, if we go back to the suspects, um, there's little known about statements made by suspects in online for the courts. But we do have research looking at the point of view of the camera on suspect interviews. That's research already starting in the early 90s. Um, and that has resulted in the way we now have our recordings of suspect interviews organized because it seemed to have an effect what you are looking at. If you only have a camera focusing on the suspect, there um, the, the people looking at it experience less pressure put on the suspect and they think the suspect is more guilty. If you focus on the interrogators instead of on the suspect, you, the, the people viewing it ex, um, experience more pressure put on this suspect and feel that the suspect is less guilty. Now, if there, is a, if there are three cameras, one on the suspect, one on the interrogators, and one showing the full interrogation room, you have the most neutral impression of what's going on in this interrogation room. And of what is said by the suspect. You tend to be more um, objective. And this is also what we saw in, in children. Close-ups are not good, but long shots showing the full, um, the full interview room uh, where the child is interviewed, you see that they have the most relaxed and the most neutral impression to the person watching it. All of these impressions eventually come to um, what is the final task of a court to decide on the veracity of the statement made by, um, by, the, um, by the witness or the suspect. Now, 
if we if we look at what we can conclude uh, based on the research I just um, summarized a little bit, we can see that we got rid of the nonverbal cues. Perfect. But in the meantime, we replaced it with something else. And at something else, we have no idea what's going on. But what we see is that it has an effect on the credibility assessment and not in a positive way. It has negative, but also subjective um, 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 affecting uh, the assessment of any statement, whether it's the suspect, the witness, or the child witness. Looking at that in a broader perspective, you could say that not only as my previous uh, speaker um, um, just summarized, it's not only an unfair uh, procedure, but it's also a biased procedure. Um, that might be a very reasonable conclusion to draw. And if this will be our new normal in courts, we first should do a lot more of research on all kinds of statements that are used online before we can say anything about the proper implementation of this. And um, also one of the things mentioned by uh, the, the previous speaker, uh, speaker was that there are technical issues with hearings of suspect. Also in the Netherlands last week, we had a court case where lots of technical issues happened and eventually the suspect was interviewed by phone in court on speaker. I think this is in short my conclusion. We need more research because we have biased decisions on online um, um, interviews with either suspects, witnesses or child witnesses. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Horsleberg, for this very interesting uh, overview. Also, although we know that there is very little research, you have highlighted some interesting uh, uh, outcomes of, of, of research that we do have. Uh, and I think that it, it gives some, uh, some food for thought when it comes to uh, uh, live uh, communication versus on-screen communication and how it potentially affects uh, how we perceive uh, statements and also possibly decision making. But as you rightly point out, this is all very uh, new and, uh, you know, we have to do a lot of, I say we because um, it, we are not going to do it all, but we are very much interested in this topic, obviously, as, as many other universities uh, are as well. Uh, we are very much interested in uh, developing research in this area and I think there's also very much a need in this. Um, thank you once again very much. Uh, I would now like to give the floor to Professor Klipp, who is a professor of criminal law, criminal procedure, and the head of our department uh, at Maastricht University Faculty of Law, and he will open uh, the debate. Uh, we have two questions already in the Q&A, which will follow after uh, Professor Klipp um, has opened the debate. And I kindly ask the members of the audience, if you have any further questions, feel free, or remarks or anything you would like to share with us on this topic, feel free to do so in the Q&A tool. And I'll give the floor to Professor Klipp. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Doris. Um... Uh, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> both speakers, for your uh, for your excellent uh, contributions. Um, I, I have first a, a, a question for uh, uh, Penelope uh, Gibbs. Uh, uh, you described uh, um, quite uh, at, at length uh, uh, shocking uh, uh, circumstances, shocking practices uh, uh, in England and Wales uh, that come down to to very little preparation to develop a lawyer-client uh, relationship uh, that also uh, affects the, the preparation, the adequate preparation for the trial. Um, many of the things may come down to uh, practical issues, um, uh, deficiencies that currently uh, um, um, uh, exist in the, uh, in the system. As, as Doris just said, uh, it, it is all new. Uh, we are we are about to, to develop it. So so my question to to you is is twofold. Uh, um, uh, um, would you uh, see things different if uh, there are no longer uh, any practical difficulties uh, when there are no 
weak connections, when there is no uh, difficulty with the angle and no difficulty with the security of the connections, all of that. Uh, and the other, uh, uh, but that is also part of, of, of my question, um, you have approached things from, from the perspective of an adversarial system, uh, England and Wales. Uh, we here in the Netherlands have a different system in which we also apply currently many in absentia proceedings. So proceedings where the defendant is not there. Um, could we not cover uh, uh, and, and repair the deficiencies of an in absentia proceeding by having the, the defendant there uh, instead of not having there at all? Some defendants choose to be absent, some defendants uh, uh, do not come because they fear the, uh, to be detained and they don't want that, but they might be willing to attend a remote hearing. Uh, and that also may link up to what you stated uh, that many of the, the, the suspects in England, many of the defendants in England had no choice. Would it be possible, would it be acceptable if there were a choice? for the suspects to, uh, to participate. I'm looking forward to your response. I, so I, I would say, remember, we've been doing this a long time, a relatively long time. So we have built up, if we haven't got research, there is lots of people's experience. So my report was in 2017 and, uh, you know, those experiences are, are still true today about the difficulties. So on technology, what I would say is, yes, we could overcome a lot if the technology was better. Um, but it has to be so much better. And it has to be in so many different places. So we're talking about a massive investment in technology. And then you have to uh, weigh that up against for, for what? But it's also a fact that you're reliant on the technology. So I'm here in my, uh, you, you know, in my study at home, you're reliant on hearing me or my internet connection, my laptop, etc. cetera. If, if we're gonna rely on ordinary people uh, having the technology, we're reliant on their technology as well. Which, which is never gonna be fail safe, I don't think. And that breaks down. So I think we're a long way away from a position where the broadband and the internet connections are good enough everywhere for that not to break down. And then we're, we would just have to do a massive investment. So the screen in the court, so there's a good Australian um, study, which I think is cited in one of the blogs that I've written one blog with the first reading list and it leads to another reading list. And there was an Australian study where they completely changed the courtroom. They changed the layout of the courtroom. They had a massive screen. They, they spent a lot of money on it, on positioning it and so on. And in that research, the outcomes didn't seem, and then they did simulated trials, the outcomes didn't seem to be so negative. So that's the sort of choice we've got. But I would say, is it worth it? Do we need, you know, is it worth all that investment? And then we still need to find out whether it makes a difference to people's behavior. Because I don't know about you, but I'm getting fed up with having meetings on Zoom. These are people I know, uh, at, you know, and I like them, but, but it's not the same. Uh, and, you know, I don't think in the end, even with good technology, it's ever going to be the same. So we need to find out what are those differences and is the trade off worthwhile? And specifically, this thing about how people perceive the process to, to being done to them. And this is where choice comes in. That at the moment, the choice is so false because we say, for instance, the prison to court, we say, oh, spend, you know, 16 hours all day getting to court for a short hearing and being in uncomfortable circumstances, or you can just have your video hearing. And what defendants are never allowed 
is the knowledge of what those trade-offs are because we don't know them. So if defendants, I mean, I'm still not sure about choice without much, much more research, but if defendants could be told, okay, if you go to court, there's a 10% higher likelihood that you'll be bailed or you'll get a, you know, 10% less likely to get a custodial sentence, but it's your choice. You can stay in prison and take that risk or come to court, but they're not given that. They're given zero information about what difference it might make. And so to me, that choice word is almost meaningless given the lack of information that the people can be given at this time and they're not given it anyway. It would be better if they were given the choice now, much better, but it should be a proper choice. And um, yeah, they're not, they're not given that choice. And then your system, I mean, I'm, I'm finding it hard to get my mind around this idea that somebody uh, would have a lot of proceedings about them without being there. We have one bit of the criminal process which can be like that. So some hearings, we call them remand hearings, but it's where the issues, the, the prisoner is uh, on remand in prison and there's, there's a decision as to whether they can be released or on bail or not. And some of those hearings are held in Crown Court uh, without the defendant there. But that's very rare in our system. So um, I am disturbed by the idea that a defendant might not be there if something is happening which affects their liberty or their sentence. So if that's the case, yes, better, if, if it could get them there. But is there another way of getting them there, which isn't video? But if, if that's the only one, then it's better if it really affects their lives and would make a difference. Um, so that's what I'd say about that. Uh, thank you so much. I think uh, the, the, the the choice uh, factor is uh, very important, uh, and and uh, it surprises me that that the current practice in England uh, does not uh, offer the choice to uh, 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 to to defendants. That that uh, um, uh, we we see that the criminal justice systems offer uh, different uh, uh, procedures. Uh, uh, a plea bargaining procedure is different. Uh, you may have a simplified procedure in other systems and you may have a fully fledged trial, uh, but it is all offered on choice uh, uh, and uh, uh, by informed consent. Um, I could imagine that, that uh, to go via uh, a virtual justice would also uh, um, uh, fall in, in that category. Yeah. Um, uh, Doris, if I if I may uh, uh, proceed uh, uh, um, with with posing a question also to uh, to uh, Robert uh, Horstlenberger. Uh, um, uh, 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 yes, of course. Uh, uh, this is a wonderful presentation with a with a perfect conclusion as a as a researcher. Uh, we need more research. Uh, yes, uh, and of course, I would uh, love you to to, to see uh, uh, to obtain. Uh, uh, all the funds you need to, to perform that research. But you can only do that research if you have practice. So uh, 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 therefore we need practice uh, uh, because then we, you can uh, uh, conduct your, your, your research. Um, you, you, you stated uh, um, or you focused very much on the, um, on the impact that uh, um, uh, virtual justice may have on interrogations and on uh, the evaluation of the behavior of the defendant. Um, that, th these are cases in which testimonial evidence is very important. Um, would, it, would, would your assessment be different when we have uh, other cases in which uh, uh, that is less prone? Um, or is that uh, uh, also a question that, that requires further research? Robert. Well, yeah, there's always research needed. That's our reason for existence. Um, um, but, well, it's not only the courts, of course, who have to decide on credibility. It's also the police officers who do interviews. Um, and they do it online, even in... Um, I'm working on cases right now where they simply make phone calls to witnesses. 
um, and start asking questions about family members who might be present in the same room, they have no clue, who might be pressuring, pressuring them to answer in certain directions. So the family member is out of the, uh, out of, um, um, the um, suspect bench. Um, it's, it's not only an effect that happens in court, it's an effect that happens in all decision makers in the whole police investigation, in the whole procedural, judicial, judicial procedure. So it's, it's the, and especially it has, it, it's the effect of the way of, of appearing, appearance that has an effect on the credibility assessment that worries me. And that's something not only in court, it's everywhere. Thank you, Robert, for that. Um, before we go to the uh, questions that have appeared in the Q&A tool, uh, I, ha I think we should uh, start maybe with the last question, which was addressed to Professor Klipp uh, uh, by uh, Femi levent Buskan. Uh, if I may, I also wonder Professor Klipp's views on remote justice as a professional judge especially regarding the management of a hearing, the ability to mute others, for example, which was already mentioned by Penelope Gibbs, and the examination of a witness or suspect's demeanor during a questioning. Uh, so if you would like to respond to that, Professor Klipp. Yeah, yeah, very, very brief. My, my experience in that is, uh, is, is rather limited. I had a few cases in which uh, uh, we, we heard uh, uh, either, either the suspect or, or witness via, via the screen. Um, mixed feelings about that. Uh, 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 the the uh, connection uh, uh, was not a problem, uh, but we, you run into other difficulties. That there is a certain time slot for the connection with the with the uh, with the prison, uh, which means that uh, you cannot uh, continue interrogating the accused for longer than the time slot. But that is, uh, in essence, that is not what we used to, to, to have. Uh, so that limits the possibilities uh, uh, severely. Um, this must be changed because otherwise you cannot conduct uh, the interrogation in the way you, you have to. Um, I, I personally see that as, as things that can be solved, uh, but are, uh, are currently a problem. Definitely, the, the, it is currently a problem. Many thanks for that, uh, Professor Klipp. Uh, we will now proceed with the questions. Um, the first question that I see here is from uh, Katie Farmer. Uh, she says, uh, thank you, Penelope, for your informative and quite shocking talk. Uh, maybe this is an impossible question. Uh, that, well, those questions we like the most, of course. But what, if anything, can be done to address these issues of virtual justice, given the underfunding of the UK justice system and fewer people wanting to qualify into legally aidable criminal law? Thank you. I think the issues about um, criminally aided uh, practitioners are, are slightly separate to this, um, but uh, I actually think it's not a funding issue. The more I've looked at it, so I'm not an economist by the way, but the more I've looked at it, the more I think that remote justice is probably more expensive because of the equipment that's got to be up in every place and you've still got the physical court running. So you've still got the courts of the, phys the, the costs of the physical court. So, so to me, it, it's not really about the underfunding. They believed it would be cheaper. Um, and we'll see if they ever publish uh, the real figures as to whether it is or isn't. Um, but I think that the what is, important is for, for us all not to sleepwalk on from COVID-19 where all this was necessary to keep justice yeah. going and to keep asking the questions and pressurizing the powers that be to answer the questions and do research. Yeah, 
Many thanks for that. I like the term sleepwalking from COVID-19. Yeah, this, because that's the risk that we do, that it gives also a not very realistic view on, on uh, how, we experience, how we should experience it, etc. Uh, then we have a next question from our colleague, Anna Pivati, and she asks, um, and I think this question is also to you, uh, Mrs. Gibbs, why were police court hearings found more expensive in England and Wales? Cost savings are a major argument in favor of virtual justice. They are a major argument because there is the illusion that it's going to be cheaper. But that's why economists need to dig deep. So the 2010 study that I referred to, which is, you know, alluded to in the second blog I linked to, actually did a proper cost benefit analysis. And I'm not an economist, but they added everything up and it was definitely more expensive. Now, one of the issues which makes it more expensive is actually the speed of throughput. I don't like using these terms because we're talking about justice here. But what we're talking about is not trials in general. We're talking about all those hearings which lead up to a trial or somebody pleading guilty in a sentencing hearing. And what it seems to be the case is that because it takes time to get everybody on a video call, the each kind of hearing is about the same time as it would be in the court, but the gaps between them are much longer and there are more adjournments asked for. And so when you actually look at how many cases are covered in a particular day, virtual justice, the way we're doing it with this hybrid system that some people are in the court and other people are on like this Zoom call, that slows everything down. And by slowing it down, it makes it more expensive. Mm -hmm. you're on mute, mute doris sorry yeah thank you um i think every every question raises a new a topic on which we could discuss for for probably hours but uh, given the the time frame that we still have i think i i best move on to the next question um okay this this one is from uh i hope i pronounce it right liana Frankot, and she says, uh, thank you both for your talks. A question for Penelope Gibbs, who is very critical of remote justice and rightly so. Um, but what, bo what would be, if anything, an alternative to remote justice in this COVID crisis without compromising on another requirement of a fair trial, that of a hearing within a period of reasonable time? Well, if we know that, that would be great. I was gonna say that's gone out of the window in England and Wales anyway. So we used to have time limits for people on remand, and those have been extended hugely. Um, I'm not saying there's a real replacement at the moment. Um, these cases, people do need to get into court and the defendants need to be seen. But for instance, uh, the police station cases. So these are people who've been detained by the police for interview. So they can't leave the custody suite until the police say they can. But most of those people are bailed and only a few are actually detained after they've been charged. So one answer, which I've said to the police is detain fewer people after charge then you wouldn't be forced to use this video uh, procedure. People could come to court or from bail as they are anyway. Um, and actually most of those, or at least half of those that the police detain post-charge are released by the court. So there's not, you know, their risk assessment of why those people need to be detained goes wrong somewhere. So you could reduce the amount of the need for videoing COVID-19 on that front, but on other, you know, and actually if you go to courts now, lots of people are going, it's socially distanced, it's happening. Um, there are witnesses who are appearing in trials from home. I have Robert's huge concerns. I saw a trial with a witness on video. The fact is they could have had somebody on their mobile phone, giving them texts of exactly what to say while they're giving their, their you know, statement, while they're giving evidence. They could have had somebody, you know, they could have had an earpiece actually in their ear um, because these uh, 
you know, these screens are not very good and you can get small earpieces. So somebody could literally have been dictating what they said. It's not safe for witnesses to do evidence from home. So I think that that really is a short term solution, but I can see why they're doing it. So yes, short term, we need to, but we should just reduce it as much as we can. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is from uh, an anonymous attendee, which is always very interesting. Uh, a question for both speakers. So maybe Robert, you want to uh, address this one. Would it be fair to say that the issue of virtual justice or procedural fairness is low on many governments agenda? And do you think the issues might be prioritized a bit more in light of the Black Lives Matter movement and the disproportionate number of black men in particular in custody and also in light of racial bias? Whoa, that's 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 a lot going on in one uh, question. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I don't know where to start with uh, with uh, answering this, but um, given the the information we have right now, I would see and would say independent whether it's um, 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 a colored person or not, or an autochtone or an autochtone, we we should treat them the same and we should take, if it's going to be online interviews, we should take a wide focus um, camera shot, a full, not on the person, but a full screen. And that would take away a lot of issues, I think, already that you don't see only the face, only the, the, the person sitting at a table, but you see the full um, interview room where it's going, to, where the person is being interviewed. Um, and I think we should focus on that more than whether governments are willing to spend money on this. Um, by the way, I think they should all arrange it at their own police stations. There are rooms enough for that, uh, instead of asking people to connect lines. And so you can control also the, the thing, uh, a panel up just addressed that people can have earpieces. Do it at the police station, have a full uh, room camera on it. And if we have to settle, I would say settle right there. I, I would just say, I think that it is one of the issues we should think about already in England and Wales, um, people from black and minority ethnic communities uh, can be more distrustful of the police um, and anything which or distrustful of the justice system and anything which increases that level of distrust is, is something we should worry about. So we need to find out. May I add to that, that um, once again, the, the, the whole reason for interviewing anyone is to gather information and we should be aware that the, 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 the way we do that has an effect on the outcome and this is this, this whole new distance thing has just added a new something we have no idea about that we should get straight before we implement it for the rest of our <laughs> lives. If I, if I may follow up uh, to that, uh, uh, also uh, in, in line of uh, um, a question posed by, by, by Levent uh, to, uh, to uh, Robert Horselberg, is uh, whether there are ways to mitigate the effects uh, that, uh, uh, of, of the appearance uh, that it leads to bias. Uh, um, could specific instructions to the trials of the fact help? Um, or once again, is it too early to say so? Um, well, instructions are very interesting. If you look at how people follow up on instructions, we're not that good in it, is it? If planes crash, we all have been in planes many times, maybe, and you all know the instructions you receive. But when planes crash, we don't follow up instructions. We do also know from the kind of research in, uh, in the United States where jurors are instructed to 
ignore the, the previous thing said, that it has a, a, a kind of a backfire effect on it, that you constantly say, I, I have to ignore this, I have to ignore this, and then you focus on it and start not ignoring the whole thing. So if you would instruct people now, ignore the appearance of the, the person you have to assess, um, probably this will backfire. So instructions would not be, but I actually, because of the lack of research, I actually do not, do not have any solutions on how to solve it. We, we do realize there is an issue and this issue is bigger than we have thought, um, but no solutions yet. Sorry. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I have a, a, another uh, a question or questions uh, uh, to uh, Penelope uh, Gibbs. I combine questions uh, posed by Christina and uh, uh, Anna Piverti. Uh, um, um, uh, would it be possible to adjust or to develop uh, the legal principles, the rights, the safeguards, uh, specifically uh, uh, for a, a, a new reality in virtual hearing, hearings? Um, are you willing, able to, to make suggestions in that direction? Um, and the, the other uh, question already alluded to is, is uh, uh, whether that might be better for uh, uh, preparatory hearings and remand hearings than for the full uh, trial. What is your view on that? So we, we are not really using uh, virtual um participation in trials apart from witnesses in magistrates court trials but but the defendants are always there physically and and still are so all the virtual uh hearings are these preparatory hearings but my concern is that i don't, I don't know in our country in these lower courts most people plead guilty so they don't go to trial um they plead guilty and they're sentenced. So it's an incredibly important hearing when they appear. And these, they, on these first appearances from the police station, they can be, if they plead guilty, they can be sentenced to custody there and then and have to go straight from the police station to the prison without ever going near the court. Uh, they, these are really important hearings. I myself have done a lot of work on the overuse of remand. I think remand hearings are incredibly important. They're about people's liberty. Uh, and at the moment, people can spend months on remand. So yes, the trial is probably the epitome, but these other hearings really matter. And sentencing hearings too from the, for very serious offences post-trial are being done this way. And as we heard from... Uh, the prisoner who wrote to me, it, isn't it important that the defendant is present when they're sentenced so that they really understand uh, the enormity of their sentence and what it means? Um, so I think it's very easy to, to say that the, the trial is, you know, the be all and end all and nothing else matters. Um, so I would say those, those, all those others matter. In terms of legal principles and safeguards, we absolutely can, but go back to that protocol in the, about police custody. So the protocol was set up to say that the, the suspect has to be um, asked whether they want their, police station, their, their lawyer in the police station or not. It doesn't work. It's not working. People are not being asked or they're being asked in such a way that they appear, they, they feel they're under pressure. So yes, you can create protocols and guidance to help people, but in the end, it's attitudes and culture which will produce the outcomes and behavior that you want. Thank you so much. Uh, it also stresses the fact that systems are different and uh, uh, um, um, in, in a system like England and Wales, what uh, uh, may be seen as a, a, a preparatory hearing can be the last hearing because yes. of the, the, the fact that, that uh, uh, the defendant may choose uh, uh, to, to, uh, to make a plea bargain a, a statement. 
um, in, in a more civil law context, uh, a preparatory hearing may still lead, well, will most, in most cases, still lead to a full trial. So the, 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 the value, the weight of such a preparatory hearing uh, can be entirely different depending on the system. Um, I, I'd like to, to, to uh, uh, I think that that will be the last question. And, and I think this is more a question for uh, uh, Robert Horslerberg. Uh, it's a question uh, posed by Lorna Cameron, uh, who is conducting research into the effects of spatial agreements, uh, arrangements, architecture and spatial protocols in criminal courts. Um, she says uh, uh, that there is a huge ambivalence uh, from all court users, uh, unless they feel inconvenienced or wronged by the process, and so dare much anecdotal and re reactive evidence, but that there's little sustained ambition for further research. Is this, and that is the question, because the work needs to be into how people are communicating and assessing justice, or is it that we don't understand how the changes in the physical interface between people and the concept of justice has changed with the advent of virtual or remote access. So do we even need a physical court and why not? And if, why not? What are we losing? Robert, you have an answer to that. Of course not, yes. No, um, that's three questions, that's three answers to the same question. Um, um, well, normally if you would implement a thing like this, you would take your time and do research and figure out what's the best way to get rid of the physical courts. But now we, we were forced everywhere in the world, we were forced to do it the way as we do it right now, um, which leads us to all kinds of ad hoc decisions and solutions of issues um, based on gut feelings. Um, and, and, and I think, um, it's time that we should be, you know, be, be looking at a more objective, a more scientific approach on, on this whole issues that we, we have encountered right now and uh, see whether there are better ways. And maybe indeed the physical courts can, can be get rid of, but um, I'm a bit hesitant to come to that conclusion because Communication is so important. And as you, as we all have experienced by now, um, even writing an email can be leading to big fights, um, and misunderstanding and not hearing the proper words because of a wrong uh, internet connection. Um, those are the things you don't want to happen when it's about decisions for people to be sent to, to, to jail for years and years. You want that to be a clear and objective um, decision without all the uh, extra luggage accompanying it. So that would be my, my answer. Please keep it the way it is, unless we have good research to change it. Thank you very much. Robert, uh, I think this last question is uh, is connected to a very important uh, uh, argument that is often used in this whole discussion, and that is that we don't want to lose the solemnity and the, the traditional uh, courtroom uh, place. But of course, I mean, looking 50 or 100 years ahead, we may be realistic and, and, and see that the way that we communicate right now will not be the way that we communicate uh, in, in 50 or 100 years. And we are now talking about on-screen communication, but by then, of course, technology has evolved much more and we will even have augmented reality, virtual reality, and may even have virtual, fully virtual courtrooms. So this is, um, I mean, this is for the future, of course. Um, okay, there was one last question, I think, from, uh, although I have seen to lost it, it's gone. No, there was a question, I think. No, it's answered already. Oh, you answered it. Well, great. Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, we had a very lively debate, uh, lovely speeches uh, covering with many different angles of this uh, interesting uh, topic, which is, uh, you know, it, it is uh, highlighted by the COVID crisis, but it is definitely not new. Uh, but it, what it does uh, show us, I mean, this whole COVID crisis and how we've dealt with it in, in our national systems, justice systems, is that we indeed need a lot of research on, uh, on the actual effects of, of remote um, 
justice. So I think we, we have covered uh, quite a few important uh, uh, topics and angles of, of this, uh, this topic. Um, many thanks again to the speakers, uh, to Professor Clip, and of course also many thanks to the audience for being so involved and active in uh, uh, posing questions. Um, thank you very much. We are going to close the meeting right now. I think we are very much on time as the Dutch are always very efficient. We do not, uh, uh, you know, spend any more time than we should. Um, many thanks again to all and um, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.